So in today's lesson, um, I want to start with a few warm-ups just to get you going and to help you remember some of the math that we've done recently. So in this question, I'm asking you, well, to explain why 2 to the power of negative 3 is not a negative number. Well, how would you show that? Well, one thing that you could certainly explain is that 2 to the power of negative 3 can be written as a positive power by taking the reciprocal of its base. And so the reciprocal of 2 over 1 is 1 half, and all of that is to the power of 3, right? Uh, now some of you will say, well, why did I need the brackets there if it's a 1 on top? And, and really you don't because, you know, 1 cubed, right, 1 cubed is 1 times 1 times 1, which really doesn't change it. So often you will actually see just 1 over 2 to the power of 3. Um, and then when I evaluate that, well, 2 cubed is 2 times 2 times 2, you'll remember, not 2 times 3. And I'm running out of a little bit of room here. So finally, you know, that gives me 1 over 8, which is not a negative number. So how would I explain that negative 2 to the power of negative 3 is not a negative number? I would discuss how when, uh, if I want to, a negative exponent can be written as a positive power by simply taking the reciprocal of the base and changing that value to a positive number. And that's it. Now next, I'd like you to try this on your own. Explain why 5 to the power of 0 has a value of 1. Um, and this is, you know, when I think about common mistakes that students make, students will often see this 5 to the power of 0, and they will think that that has to have a value of 0. And of course, well, we did an exercise yesterday that sort of showed that it wasn't zero, equal to 0. Um, so, but how, do, how did we show that? Well, one thing that I could do is I could say, well, if I have 5 to the power of, I'm going to say 2, divided by 5 to the power of 2, my exponent laws will tell me that that's equal to 5 to the power of 2 minus 2, which is 5 to the power of 0, right? But I also know that another way that I could write out this expression is in its, its expanded form, which is to say 5 times 5 divided by 5 times 5. And I know, of course, 5 divided by 5 gives me 1. And 5 divided by 5 gives me 1. And 1 times 1, of course, gives me 1. So that's how I can say that 5 to the power of 0 is equal to 1, because this whole thing right here is equal to both 1 and 5 to the power of 0. And so there is my explanation. And so <clears throat> here's a third of our warm-ups. So um, in this warm-up, um, it says, explain why is it, is it is often better not to rely on your calculator to evaluate powers with a fractional base, um, and specifically when I have a negative exponent, when I have a negative power. Um, so, I mean, you could probably answer this by trying to do this calculation by simply inputting 7 over 2. <clears throat> and then to the power of negative 2. And I'm going to actually do that. So 7 divided by 2, and then I'm pressing my y to the x button. So essentially, this is what I'm typing in here. I'm just going to do this in red on the side. 7 divided by 2, and then I'm going to press my y to the x button, and then my negative 2. And then I'm going to see what that works out to be. And I'm getting this big long decimal, 0 0.08163, blah, 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 blah. So the answer to why it is better to not to rely on your calculator is because often you'll get these nasty repeating decimals that are very inaccurate um, or just really kind of painful to write. So I want to revisit this. I'm going to kind of get rid of some of this. Let me erase this. And then we'll revisit this if I use my exponent laws. 
and see the nice clean answer that I get. So people often say, well, fractions are nasty. Well, sometimes these decimals can be nasty. So I know right off, using my exponent laws, I can take the reciprocal of my base in order to change that exponent to a positive value. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So 7 over 2 raised to the power of negative 2 is equivalent to 2, to the power, 2 over 7 to the power of positive 2. And, you know, so running out of room here, I'm going to start this up here. You know, that's really, you know, 2 squared over 7 squared, which is 4 over 49. And that is a lot prettier than the other decimal that I had. So why is it useful to not use your calculator when you're um, evaluating negative powers with fractional bases? Well, you often end up with these repeating or long decimal answers that are less accurate than their fractional answers. So I mentioned at the end of yesterday's class that I would be doing a screencast to describe the word problem or that, uh, that would be serve as an example for this section of our unit. Um, so um, I've intentionally hidden what the question is actually going to ask you for because I think it's important for us to, you know, some of us rush into, well, what is it that I'm finding instead of just making sense of the question itself, kind of trying to visualize it. Um, before uh, sort of jumping in and trying some things. And right off the bat, I've noticed a little typo, so I'm going to fix that. I've noticed that here I've written 2 to the 2 dash negative 1, but what I really meant was 2 to the negative 1, 2 to the power of negative 1. So let's read the question together. It says carbon-14 is a radioactive element that decays to 1 half or 2 to the power of negative 1 of its original amount after every... 5,700 years. So let's first look at this 1 half and 2 to the power of negative 1. Why have I been able to say that? Well, I know that 1 half is equal to 2 to the power of negative 1 um, if I'm looking to relate my negative exponent to and rewrite it as a positive power. I know that those are equivalent ways of writing the same thing. So now let's look at the second part of this question, which is, you know, it decays to its it decays to one half of its original amount after every 5,700 years. So you know, let's just say, for example, I'm going to use some nice easy numbers. Um, let's just say I don't know how much the question says how much, but I'm going to just pretend that I have, you know, let's say I have a certain big chunk, and I know of of my <clears throat> of my carbon, I know that after 5,700 years, it's going to decay to half of what it was. So in other words, I cut this in half, and only half of that is remaining, right? And so after another 5,700 years, I know that whatever I had before is going to get cut in half. So here's this little bit over here. So every time... 5,700 years passes, the quantity, the original amount of what I had, decreases by a factor of one half. That's actually what we call half-life, the half-life for an element. So now let's take a look at the question itself. I'm going to get rid of some of this because I think it's kind of getting messy and it might cloud some of what are we're thinking. So there are a couple of ways that I can think about this. I can use my common sense to a point, but sometimes it's less efficient to do this um, using thinking it's better to sort of develop a formula that allows you to work with more challenging uh, or lengthy questions. So this question is saying to me that determine the remaining amount of 10 grams of carbon-14 after... 1100 years. Okay, so, you know, I need to say, well, how many 5,700 year periods have gone by after 11,400 uh, 11, years? So I can say, well, I know that, oops, I know that 11,400 years divided by 5,700 gives me two half-life periods. 
So in other words, two of these little stages have gone by to give me 11,400. Uh, 11, so um, I can say, all right, well, that tells me that I started with 10 grams here. So then how much must be left after, fifth, after one half-life period? Well, five grams. And after another half-life period, half of that, which is 2.5 grams. So that would be an easy way to solve this um, because I know that two half-life periods have passed. However, what if these numbers were not so nice? And what if it was like billions of years? Then I couldn't just keep sort of going through this process uh, well, I could, but it wouldn't be the most efficient way to go about it. So I need to think about a more efficient way to do this. So let's see if we can come up with a formula that will allow us to solve for, um, you know, for bigger numbers here or less convenient numbers. So I'm going to use C as my variable just because it's carbon that we're talking about. And I know that really what I did up here was I said, well, I had my 10 grams and then I took half of that for the first half-life period of 5,700 years. And then I multiplied by a half again because there was a second half-life period. So let me rewrite that. I'm going to rewrite that as 10, my original amount, times 1 half squared. Another way, if I really wanted to, I could write that 1 half as 2 to the power of negative 1 squared. And so, you know, that will also give me, um, give me my answer, which happens to be the 2.5 that we thought of, right? So in this case, I would say probably simpler to work it out. But if there were more complicated or less convenient numbers, uh, or larger numbers, um, maybe not the most efficient way to go about it. All right, so in second part B, in the second part of this question, they're asking about 28,500. Now, if you can do the mental math, that's great. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and show us the process to figure out how many half-lives have passed. Um, again, just in case some, at some point the numbers are not as convenient. So I know that, you know, I'm starting with 28,500 uh, years and I know that there um, is 5,700 years per half-life period. That's how long it takes for the original amount to decrease by a half. And so that gives me four. So in other words, four half-life periods. And that's actually not terrible. I could guess and check my way through that one. But I want to use our formula. So just to try it out. So C is equal to the original amount, which was 10 grams. And then I am halving the original amount four times. Alternatively, I could write that as 10 to the power of times 2 to the power of negative 1 to the power of 4. And then I could work out my answer there. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and do that. So 10 times 1 half to the power of 4 is equal to 10 to the p times 1 over 16, which will give me roughly 0 0.625 grams. And so ignoring significant digits, as we would in science, we would be looking at that. I'm not expecting that in grade 10 math, but here we are. So uh, so there's a simple example. And so if, let's say, for example, another question were to give you a value where you ended up with not a nice clean number um, or a much larger um, amount of time that's gone by, you would be able to use a formula such as this to help you work through it. Hope that helps. Please look on Google Classroom in order to see what your homework assignment is for today.